Great. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Before I start, actually, I would like to uh, I would like to show a, s a short video. It's about three and a half minutes that was uh, was shown for the first time a week ago or seven days sorry four, five days ago at UNHCR's executive committee, and I think it sets the stage for this evening. Today, 60 million refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced. Almost double the number 10 years ago. It's a rising tide spilling across borders. هي ميتين ميتين من الدول العربية هو موت واحد هو قررنا هو هي موت أو المصاب أو المصاب. Fifteen conflicts, either new or burning again, in the last five years. Forty-two thousand five hundred people displaced each day, every day. Mega conflicts in Syria and Iraq have displaced fifteen million people. Conflict pushing refugees and migrants into flight. Protracted exile, lives of extreme poverty, hopelessness, driving thousands to risk their lives. Mediterranean deaths in 2015, almost 3,000 and climbing. The desperate drive to find safety has overwhelmed some countries, stretched the resources of others, but also awakened generosity. Across the globe, countries that have taken in so many need much more help now. Another pressing need to protect people against populist racism and xenophobia. But most of all, these people need more hope. UNHCR was born of the search for new values in the wake of a global war, its principles enshrined in the 1951 convention. Those pillars must now be safeguarded and strengthened. So thank you, and thank you for, for the organizers. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, 
I hope the concepts I'm going to discuss today will be relatively straightforward. I think the problem will be actually implementing them, which I think will take uh, decades. There, there's been a change in the last uh, five years or so. There have been more conflicts. The magnitude, the size of these conflicts, the simultaneity of these conflicts has really pushed the humanitarian system to its brink. And in fact, as, as the High Commissioner has said, the humanitarian system is broken. It, it can no longer function in, these sort of, uh, in this environment. Uh, it's a tough thing to say that it's broken, but it is broken. And one of the key issues that we have been and that we will discuss is actually seeing how we can work with development partners. The idea of a, of a humanitarian development divide, which is a, is a false dichotomy to begin with, um, is no longer relevant. We need to be able to work together to address these, both those that are affected as well as those that, um, that are accepting the refugees, the national populations. So to start with is just the, the paradigm that we have now. You, you will see this has changed, but most of the way we respond to refugees in the world have been, and in the, in the way we assist the protocols, have been developed for refugee camps. And you can see there that four out of 10, 40% uh, of refugees are in camps. Years ago, it was much more. Now things have changed and more and more refugees are, are outside of camps. Yet again, the way we respond as an agency, but the way the whole humanitarian community responds is currently insufficient. The other area, you'll hear a number and you'll see it in many, uh, many discussions about uh, the average refugee is a refugee for 17 years. Give or take, that number is, is debatable um, because it's, the calculation is complex. But you can see here that 45% of refugees have been a refugee for over five years in 26 countries. This means we have a protracted, serious protracted situation. Syria, is Syria an emergency or is it a protracted situation at this point? It's likely both. I think I can use this, yes. So one of, the, uh, one of the policies that we've been working on for years following an urban policy is what's called alternative to camps, or A2C. It's quite simple. However, as I mentioned, actually um, implementing this would be very difficult. So the idea is that we want to pursue, whenever possible, refugees not to be in, in camps, but it depends on various issues related to the protection of refugees, Ultimately, the, the, the person, the group that decides this is the national government. And as you can imagine, it's quite a complex situation when you look at some countries, Kenya, for example, um, which have the, the refugee camps in Dadaab now is the second or third largest city in, uh, in Kenya. So governments have to decide and they have to weigh security versus freedom of movement for refugees. Secondly, and another big issue, is that people, they need to look at the economy. And this is one of the big issues that we're going to be talking, I'm going to be speaking about today, is the economy. It's extremely difficult for many governments, particularly very poor governments, with very, very high uh, unemployment rates, to allow refugees to actually have freedom of movement and freedom to work. And we will discuss that. Oops, wrong way. Voila. So, in the alternatives to camps, um, sorry, it's hard, I have to look at this way to see the slides. A favorable, what we need is a favorable national legal and policy framework. But again, a lot goes into, into deciding that. And what currently we don't have sufficient evidence to be able to show very clearly, I'm going to show you some, that if we say to governments, host governments, particularly those that are hosting millions of refugees, that refugees should not be in camps, they should have freedom of movement, that they should have the right to work, and that will benefit not just the refugees, but will actually benefit the local economies as well. There's questions to that, and it's very complex. In the Syria situation, and I'll show you some data, we've started for the first time to be able to actually go look in detail of how refugees, and we're working with the World Bank, how refugees are affecting the local economies, both positively and negatively, as well as how refugees are affecting the national resources. As I'm sure most of you are aware, Jordan has a serious water problem to begin with. The huge uh, amount of refugees, there are over now 650,000 registered refugees, and likely more than that in Jordan proper, 
uh, and how that's affecting the natural water resources is extreme. So if, and that's a big if, if governments agree that uh, refugees can stay out of camps, they cannot just um, they cannot just depend on humanitarian assistance. They will need a right to work, because what's happening in most of these refugee camps is once you start a refugee camp, it's extremely difficult to end that situation. Refugees become dependent on aid. There's no sustainability. The local governments, there's a tremendous amount of money and power that comes into when these local districts, when the international community comes in. And once you start, it is extremely difficult to stop. And therefore, the best way is not to start a camp, but to actually um, allow refugees to be outside of camps. But that requires jobs. So UNHCR started, it's, uh, we have four different strategic plans. One of them is a livelihoods plan. We've never had that before in the organization. And to be frank, most of the livelihoods projects that we've done throughout the years in refugee camps have not been uh, well done. They've been, you know, the classic will train women to do hairdressing and basket weaving. And it has had very little effect both on the economy, as local economy, as well as helping the refugees. So we have a new policy here, and we're working with economists to be able to look at what the local economy, the, the issues of the local economy, what are the gaps. We're trying to profile the refugees to see actually what they can, um, what, what are their skills and what are needed. Also, we're trying to change the dynamic and the mindset all within UNHCR. Um, it's very common, we think, many people think of refugees as dependent, as vulnerable, and as needy. But as we all know, that's not necessarily the case. And for the most part, refugees are very innovative, like immigrants, like all of us. They're just normal people that have been uprooted from their, from their houses, from their places of residence. But they are not given what they need to be able to actually be productive. So the whole idea of this policy is to actually help them to be productive but, and this is the big but, to also show and make an effect for the national, particularly the local population surrounding them, so that in theory it can be a win-win situation. Here are just some of the areas that we're working on uh, within, and we're working with UNDP because UNHCR is by no means a development organization, and we don't have the skills to be able to do this. So, as you mentioned, we're, we're looking, at, we're reaching out, and partnerships are key. And so, we're we're not trying to develop all of the expertise in house. We're working outside, particularly with the bank. Syria, Syria are they're they're famous. The Syrians are famous for their artisan. Um, they are incredible artists that actually can do a tremendous amount, and most of them see themselves thirteen or sorry, not most, fifteen percent or so of Syrian refugees identify as artisans. We have been trying to work, particularly in Lebanon and Jordan, to look at the skills that they have, but also to work with the in Lebanon, for example, as many of you know, there are incredibly talented artists. We are trying to look at the traditional ways that the Syrians work, work with the Lebanese to, let's say, modernize, and then look at the value chain. And we're trying to work with multinationals that may be able to buy some of these products. And in theory, it will help both the Syrians and, uh, and the Lebanese. In principle, however, both in Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey, it's very controversial, and for the moment, the refugees do not have officially the right to work, except in some areas in Jordan. So we're working with them to try to, with the World Bank, which I hope will be, yes, the next slide, to try to look and, ex and study what is happening and will, um, by opening up, by having the governments open up to allow refugees to work, how can we or how will the local economies uh, ad uh, adapt? So there are two, two studies I want to show you. Let's see if I have a pointer. No, I'm sure it is here. Living in the Shadows was done uh, by UNHCR in 2014. And what it's showing is that clearly that the refugees are becoming, more and more, are becoming poorer and poorer over time, which is not a surprise if they're not allowed uh, the right to work and to be able to actually make a living. Um, this is this is so two thirds of the refugees are below the national poverty line. I looked it up just before I came. The national poverty line in Jordan is about a thousand a thousand dollars, and you can see that one sixth of the refugees 
are now living with less than $40 per person per month, which is unsustainable. This is very similar to what's happening in Lebanon, which again is not a surprise why you see a massive movement uh, outside of the Middle East to, to Europe. Now this just came out August, October 1st, and this is by Jim Kim, the head of the, the World Bank, who himself uh, was an immigrant from South Korea to the United States in 1964. And it's saying, looking, looking for a global strategy, support refugees. This is initial, some of the preliminary data, but it's showing that in 2014, 26% of the new foreign businesses were actually by Syrians uh, in Turkey. What's happened is, and this is very common, that many of the refugees will go into the informal sector, and therefore they may undercut some of the local populations, those that are also working. But what's interesting in this study is that there's been a more of a, for, with the refugees, because there's now over two million refugees in, uh, in Turkey, there's been more of a formalization of the job markets. And those informal Turks that were working in the informal sector, many of them now have been actually been, because they've had to adapt, they're getting more into the formal sector and actually their wages are increasing. The pre preliminary studies, and we're looking at this in Jordan and Lebanon as well, so again, I didn't put in because of room, but that the poverty rates may have felt fallen faster in those regions in Turkey hosting the Syrian refugees than elsewhere. Because as you can imagine, the refugees are there are not alone. Um, the World Food Program, UNHCR, the donors are putting in millions and millions of dollars, and they're having a very, very big effect on the, uh, on the, refugees, on the refugees, but also the local economy. So now, this is something that I'm actually very excited about. Refugees now have, um, let's say they're out of camp, they have jobs. What are they going to do with that money? There's been a very, very big shift. In fact, the ECHO has been pushing this, ECHO and DFID uh, have been pushing this towards cash-based interventions. For the most part, what we have been doing for many, many decades is providing in-kind assistance. And as you know, in the past, it has changed, but many donors were actually uh, taking their excess food, bringing it to the, giving it to the World Food Program, and it was being shipped to, uh, to refugees worldwide. Now, um, there's a push towards cash-based interventions, and I will show you, you can read different, uh, different approaches. But where, why I'm excited is that in the past, there, there has been conditional cash-based interventions for many years. But what's happening now is there's a move towards unconditional or what's called multi-purpose grants. And so in Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey, refugees are actually depending on the organization, but we're trying to get them out all together, refugees are receiving ATM cards with a certain amount of money on it. And we're looking, in the past we, we were always very sector specific, but this is now causing all of the sectors to actually work together and for the first time, to my knowledge, at least within, within, the, uh, within these crises, we're measuring minimum expenditure baskets of refugees, we're targeting those that are most vulnerable, and they're getting a certain amount of money. And as opposed to us, the, the, the international community, choosing what they can buy, they choose themselves. And we have done this on and off for many years, but this, we've never done it at this level. And number one is the dignity that, uh, that this provides to the refugees is extraordinary. And we've done a lot of, of surveys, and it's very clear as anyone in the world would prefer not to be given something, but to have a choice of what to buy. We have, um, it's very paternalistic, so we're often used to giving refugees um, certain grains, certain blankets, and there was a, a bit of a backlash early on saying, but of course the men will all spend it on drugs or alcohol and, uh, and sex work. And we as a protection agency, we had a lot of to do, and so what I'm, we had a lot, to, a lot of work to do to change the, the um, the ingrain way of us, our thinking, and how we will respond in the future, and we've seen a very positive, uh, we've seen a very positive response actually towards this. What's happened though? So, so UNHCR and its and its uh, partners have been giving unconditional uh, grants, multi-purpose grants, in Jordan, Lebanon. The Turkish government has been giving uh, that as well, and the World Food Program has been giving vouchers. Um, and here are just some examples, but if you look on the corner there, the far corner, this is a supermarket in Zatri refugee camp in Jordan. 
Uh, it's now one of the largest cities in Jordan. And if you look there, you can see on the right, it's a, it's a machine, but refugees have vouchers. This is a supermarket that local traders have been actually brought in. Um, and there's been a lot of competitive bidding in order to do this so that the prices are um, competitive and hopefully even slightly lower. And then refugees go in and are able to choose. And it's, it's actually a supermarket very similar to the supermarkets uh, in Europe. This is in Jordan, and this is a um, UNHCR. What we are giving, we're working with a bank, and in some ways they're further advanced, so we don't even give cards anymore because on the top there, it's an iris scan. So all of the banks in, in uh, this, with this particular bank, sorry, has iris scans for the Jordanians and the refugees now, which is hugely important because of biometrics. And their donors, rightly so, are concerned about fraud. Um, with vouchers, with ATM cards, and with, uh, with codes, fraud is very easy. So as we move more and more towards biometrics, this will be hugely important. We're also working on different ways. So that's what WFP is giving those machines to many vendors throughout the world. And as you know, in, in Kenya and many other places, mobile money is, is working. The reason why this is important is because it will change the way humanitarian assistance is given. Number two, though, is in theory, this will, and we've seen this already, there's a multiplier effect because we are not bringing in, flying in um, these assistance, these goods, but they're actually being bought locally. So there's a multiplier effect for the local economy, and when we're talking tens of millions of dollars, it may have a very positive effect uh, for the economy and therefore complements what we're trying to do to say that refugees coming into a country may have a positive effect. Um, both for the refugees and the locals. We're also looking at, and we've not done this before, but we are changing our outlook in many ways. We're working with private sector much more than we have in the past. Again, I'm not speaking just for HCR, but the, the humanitarian community. And we're working with um, financial sectors in particular because, again, we don't have the expertise to be able to, and it's, it's, I can tell you it's a lot of work to be able to negotiate country by country, bank by bank, how to do uh, cash-based interventions. We're also working with Western Union because, as you're likely aware, they're one of the largest countries and the uh, largest organizations um, in the world dealing with remittances. And remittances are huge, and we don't have a handle at all on the remittances that occur, um, refugees worldwide, what they are receiving. And it may be, in many situations, that the remittances that refugees are receiving may be higher than actually um, what we are providing in humanitarian assistance. <coughs> We also hope to be able to eventually have what are called virtual bank accounts for refugees. There was a story I remember in, um, it was an Iraqi refugee in Syria many years ago, and his biggest concern was that he didn't have access to a bank account, and he had uh, relatives somewhere else who wanted to send him money, but there was no way to do it. In the future, if we're able to actually register refugees, that way we, you know, by, via biometrics, and if we're also able to establish a virtual bank account, there may be ways that uh, we can actually reduce the amount that the humanitarian community has to provide and that uh, their friends, their relatives will be able to get them money as well. Currently, that doesn't exist. And the last, before I move on to, to insurance and integration, relates to development and development partners. And in fact, this really should be a separate, uh, a separate topic. We're working... Um, with the European Commission, with USAID, but most importantly, not well, as importantly as the World Bank. Things are changing now, even the Global Fund to, uh, Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. They are all looking at their existing systems, their development systems, and trying to adapt them to a changing world. It makes no sense, as we do currently, that the humanitarian world comes in, they start pouring in humanitarian aid, but there's often an insufficient or no connection to the development uh, plans of that country. Plus, the development plans are planned years in advance, and they take years to, to work, and we need to be able to change that. There needs to be a much more flexibility amongst all the partners. We have made some steps, I would say some significant steps, in, uh, in Jordan and Lebanon, but we're not yet seeing the fruits because 
systems take a lot of time to change, and this is going to be a this is going to take longer than we would have hoped. But we hope in the future that development and humanitarian actors. We hope that it won't be one or the other. The, there's an emergency. The development people leave. The humanitarian people come in. When there's the end of the emergency, although they're often just it's very protracted, then the development come back in. We need to be able to work together. Yet at this point, the systems are not there for us to actually make a huge difference, but they are coming, and um, the World Bank in particular is making some major changes. <clears throat> so if we have, they're out of camp, they have a job, cash in a bank account. What happens when they become seriously ill? I mean, there, there are major, major issues, of course, as you can imagine. Education is another big, big area. but. And, and also I'm biased because I'm a physician, but when we look at what happens in many of the refugee settings, we see that a catastrophic illness um, can really have, as you can imagine, a major effect. The other thing before I would also like to, to mention is that with this, it actually started in the Balkan crises, but now um, with Iraq and Syria is these are middle-income countries, and therefore the way, not only did were most of our, the way we responded was for refugees in camps, they were rep for refugees in sub-Saharan Africa or years ago in Southeast Asia with a non-communicable disease, uh, sorry, a communicable disease focus. Now, more and more, we need to deal with non-communicable diseases, and we're dealing with very serious tertiary care. We had to, with the Iraqi crisis, we had to redo all of our protocols dealing with renal dialysis, dealing with cancer. Um, there's a tremendous amount, and these refugees, many of the Iraqis and the Syrians, had many had diagnoses of cancer, came over to, to countries, and we had to figure out a way to continue that treatment. Yet, as you can imagine, tertiary care is incredibly expensive. So we developed... Um, over the last few years, we have been working on various public health policies, and this, is, again, is just a, a strategy. But what I want to show you in particular is a change where in the past we would often, because they were in camps in very remote area, we would have parallel services. We now say very clearly, please, let's not have camps if we can avoid it, and let's not have parallel health or education systems. Let's try to use the existing national systems and integrate refugees. But as you can imagine, that can be very, very difficult, particularly in areas where the, the health and the education systems are non-existent. But um, that is our, our clear policy now on integration. And what we've been working on, I won't, don't expect you to read all of this, but I'm giving you some examples. We have been looking at health insurance schemes for refugees, um, things that uh, we never anticipated health insurance uh, 10 years ago, even 15 years ago when, when we started, when I started working um, specifically at UNHCR. Um, the first time this came up was actually Iran. And Iran has been one of the most generous countries in the world to refugees, and the Afghan refugees in particular. And they came to us to say, so many of these refugees, they have um, very serious diseases. They're using our hospitals. UNHCR, you're not paying for them. Um, the refugees can't afford them, so we're paying for them. And it's taken us seven years. Um, you'll see here, I think, I, we have 220,000, soon to be a million. We signed uh, three weeks ago before our executive committee where Iran has agreed that refugees, there are approximately 850 to 1 million Afghan refugees registered. All of them will now be integrated into the, um, into the, Afghan, uh, the Iranian uh, system. That's a huge thing, and what it means also is that um, Iran, firstly, does not have, they have some settlements, but most of the Afghans are outside. Many are allowed to work. They have permits to work. UNHCR has agreed that we will pay, there's a significant vulnerability across the board as there, there is in every country. So we will pay some of the, the health premiums, but the refugees themselves will pay most of the premiums, um, and then the Iranian government as well will be paying a tremendous amount. We're working on this in Malaysia, Congo, although very, very small, and Ghana is now, although a small number of refugees have agreed to allow refugees into the national health insurance uh, system. So I don't have too many more slides, and I'm, I'm actually looking forward to hearing some of your questions. But some of the way forward is in this particular area, 
is that we need to advance legislation and systems, look at social security systems in many of these countries to see how refugees can actually get into the social security, but without bankrupting, bankrupting obviously, the, the, the host government. Um, and all of this is interconnected. If refugees would be able to pay premiums because they would have the right to work, that may be able to help um, the national system because the more payers you have, ultimately, um, the better the system can be because of shared risk. There's also a, a dream that, uh, that we have, like with a virtual bank account, we would love to be able to work and see, as opposed to UNHCR each time, paying maybe for a parallel system, trying to pay the government to integrate in by improving their systems or international health systems, would it be possible to have a consortia of health insurance companies throughout the world and that UNHCR, together with its donors, would pay a certain amount of money per refugee up front and therefore the, refugees, ref, the health insurance companies would have uh, in those countries, in those countries, host countries that actually have health insurance systems, we would have, we would be paying, and then when an emergency occurs, if the health insurance system is functioning in that country, they would automatically be included into those systems. And that would, the cost efficiencies of that would be huge. This at this, at this point is just a dream, but it's something that we would like to see. Again, it relates um, with, to the possibility of refugees being able to make some money to be able to pay for these premiums. So, in summary, these are some. Of, these are the four big areas that we're looking at. We're looking at uh, policies on alternatives to camps. We will. You'll see recently in in many of the Boko Haram areas, um, the governments, because particularly because many of the refugees are near the borders. They're, and understandably, they're insisting on camps, at least in some situations, for security reasons. But there are also, in Cameroon, there's a history of, of, uh, of the refugees being dispersed and actually integrated into communities because of the ethnic, uh, ethnic similarities between the, the Nigerians and the, the Camerounais. Eh? So there's a need for alternatives to camp. There's a need for right to work and livelihoods and self-reliance. Cash-based interventions will likely change the way we respond in humanitarian assistance, and if we can combine that with the development actors and the donors showing much more flexibility in their development funds, being able to change the development plans according to the reality in the field very quickly. And then finally, if we we're looking at better integration into government systems, I'm mentioning health insurance, but uh, education is equally as important. And you will find very, very uh, commonly the once refugees have their basics, and including health, the next thing they want is education for their children, and not just primary and secondary. They want tertiary when, when feasible. If we can work on this together, I think the concepts are relatively clear, but actually putting them into action, I think will take a long, long time. But together with, with the help from, uh, from many of the people that are represented in this room, but also together with the younger students here who will hopefully be able to push for this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, policy and framework in the future, I hope that we'll be able to succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for uh, a fact-filled and idea-filled presentation that um, laid out the paradigm shift that has happened in the international community, I think spearheaded by um, uh, UNHCR and, and uh, UNDP, uh, on how to deal with uh, refugees and the refugee crisis and, mi and migration. I think it, uh, it was a fascinating uh, lecture to listen to in particular. Uh, for anybody who's interested in policy innovations and how we can address a problem from different angles. And uh, you say the concepts are very straightforward, but you have to come to them in the first place, and then you worry about how to, to implement. Uh, we have some time for uh, Q&A, and as it is a tradition here, we would like you to identify yourself, say who you are, and uh, what organization or institution you come from, and uh, then please uh, uh, try to be brief in your question that would allow us to have 
as many voices heard as, as possible. And uh, we have microphones uh, here, so people uh, around here. So if you just raise your hand, if you want to make a comment, we have a lady up, up front. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Leona Meyer from the Schiller Institute. And um, I want to say that uh, I think it's uh, very good, the different things you mentioned. But one other thing is that we have to look again at the cause of the refugee crisis. And uh, I think it has a lot to do with the also uh, yeah, Western-supported wars in the near Middle East for about 20 years or so. And that uh, this whole regime change policy that we think we can export our fantastic democracy to all these nations is not quite functioning and that we should change that policy also. And then um, one example is that uh, Russia and China Can you, what is the question then? Uh, have uh, also a plan for the development of Afghanistan, for example, real infrastructure development and so on. And I think this is maybe something that Europe and the United States should work with Russia and China together on to deliver real basic infrastructure development to the whole near Middle East, Northern Africa region and how you can uh, support this in the UNHCR. Thank you. We take one more uh, question from right here. Thank you. Yeah. My question is in a completely other direction. I'm a member of parliament. Um, member of the um, Committee on Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid. And um, we have um, a lot of refugees now in Germany. That means in a developed country where um, the, the coexistence of developmental aid and humanitarian aid doesn't exist as um, funding from outside, but where we have to um, take our own um, tax money to find solutions for our um, refugees. Do you have any statistical, statistical data about the advantage of what you showed about um, giving them the possibility to work, mm. giving them um, health insurance and so on? Um, how this would um, be an advantage in a country like Germany? Yeah. Would you like to take one more? Or should take these two? And uh, yeah, I, th I think it it takes a while to realize that what you propose is just short of revolutionary in, in the German <laughs> context, right? <laughs> so we should let it sink in, and that would allow us to perhaps to have one more question. And this is the lady right there. Thank you. And the first question was about. Uh, I think what I take from the first question is uh, how does uh, Russia fit in? Because we we have the European Union here. Does Russia play a role, an active role? In I'm that, just yeah. giving feedback from a physician viewpoint, and I just had a very interesting day going to La Gezo in the morning because of a project we're doing there. Uh, so I'm working with Charité, but also with a nonprofit called the Vienna Vaccine Safety Initiative. And you know, on my way out, I was being hugged by some adolescent girls, that eight-year-olds who recognized me from a medical point, and we took some pictures. Then I was running late, then I took a taxi to another place where we're providing aid in a first reception center, which is a combination of a former police academy and a tent village in the center. And I usually, when I take a taxi, I start a conversation about this topic. It's my little personal poll. And this time, the taxi driver was a, a very German, traditional, grew up in Eastern Germany, a very politically versed, um, interesting person. And I think one of the concerns that I see is, is sort of this okay, now we've reached a minimum wage in Germany, and where are we gonna go when we have this influx of people who may not make the same demands? Same questions about healthcare. So I, I really like the, the points you've been making, but my question is similar a little bit to the lady over there. Uh, in a fairly well-developed country, how can you prevent a parallel economy from evolving that may disrupt some of the sort of social advancement that's mm. been made uh, over time. I think that's sort of the medical health care question, but also the economic question in one. Yeah. Thank you. Over to you. Okay. <laughs> easy ones. Yeah, yeah, easy yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, 
firstly, maybe with, with for, for your question in Germany, the, there aren't statistics yet on that specific, what you're talking about for the refugees and the Syrian refugees. But um, I have been able, we have been able to look, I mean, the, many of the Syrian refugees that are coming, particularly the ones that have been coming most recently and the earliest, are actually have means and have many, many skills. These are not uh, equivalent to, many of these are not illiterate people who are, are who have who have very limited skills. And in fact, um, so just like, I think what, what, and I was reading recently, just in the, the Economist, uh, this week's Economist, is if you look at refugees and you look at migrants, many of them bring a, a vitality and if I'm not mistaken, in Germany, unlike in, in where I come from in Canada and the US, where there already is a huge amount of immigration, you're going to be needing some young, vital people to make a difference in, uh, in your economy for the future so that as we all get older, they can pay for our social security. So, so I think that it's, I, I, it depends. You will, you, refugees and immigrants are all are very similar. They're a microcosm of just a normal society where you have an incredible amount of high achievers. You'll have people that will likely be uh, costing the, the government uh, some money. But many of the people that are coming here, and also Syria was a very, and was a very they were very well educated uh, and, and actually quite secular society. So, um, Although the facts, the, the data may not be there, um, some of the data that are, we're even seeing in Turkey may apply here. Do you want to address the question about Russia? Yeah. I don't because, oh, maybe I can only say this, is that all foreign policy in Europe, North America, China, Russia, is not just to do good. Governments are advancing their interests. That's the idea of foreign policy. So that you, I think we would have to be able to look, there's a, there's a tremendous amount going on, as you know, particularly uh, with Russia right now and what's happening in Syria. So while everyone, I think, would, in theory, like to work together, there's a lot that has to be looked at to see what will happen. I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, what China is proposing in Afghanistan, but I am very familiar with how they're working in Africa, and it's not to promote human rights and equality in, in those areas. It's to work very closely to economically, to help that country economically, but to also gain substantially for their, their economies. So I think we need to be able to look at what they're proposing um, and what is feasible. But on top of that, Afghanistan right now is, is security-wise, is becoming worse and worse and worse. And so we have to see what sort of um, projects can even be implemented in Afghanistan at this point. Yeah, thank you. There was, uh, we have some, uh, yeah, uh, a lady there. And the, the, there was a gentleman in, in the middle that I've seen. But there's a lady in the middle. We, we'll go to, to you next. Hello. Yeah, and um, we, uh, my name is Lisa Seiler. I used to work shortly for UNHCR, and now I'm uh, currently starting um, an organization here in Germany that um, works with refugees and asylum seekers to integrate the labor market in Germany. Um, and my question would be, there are a lot of different initiatives currently coming up in Germany that um, are trying to work together with refugees and asylum seekers to integrate in Germany and also in other European countries. Where does UNHCR see its role uh, in this um, situation? But not only in Germany, but also in the entire European context. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The, and the lady with, um, with the, yeah, the blue sweater. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'm from the German Ministry of Development Corporation. Um, I have a rather technical question. Um, you said you prefer unconditional cash transfers over conditional cash transfers. And I was wondering, um, you know, part of our policy has been not to condition the cash transfers in terms of what the refugees or development um, recipients can spend it on, but on a condition they fulfill so it would advance development aid. So in the idea um, they get to spend the money freely, but therefore they need to, they, um, to send their children to school. That's, that's the idea of the condition, not to, to condition it on, on certain spending. So um, you lose 
you lose the incentive for development objectives. Why, why is then unconditional better? And then maybe you said it, it's a lecture in its own, but we would need better cooperation between the humanitarian and the development cooperation. Can you give us at least some buzzwords of what needs to improve and how we can mm -hmm. um, uh, bridge that dichotomy, which you said it's faulty and unhealthy? Thank yeah. you. So we take one more question up here. Thank you. Um, so hello, my name is Olympia. I'm a student here at the Herty School, and my question is: you can, Looking at the Europe perspective, European perspective once again, I want to ask you: What do you think can be done at a city level, mm -hmm. given that in an urban governance perspective, for example, to support integration of refugees when refugee policy is mostly decided on a national or federal level? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So we have three questions. One is about the world of UNHCR in the European. Uh, context and uh, uh, it's not at all technical. Whenever it says conditionality, it's all but technical, right? Mm -hmm. So the, tech, uh, the conditionality question, and uh, then uh, your question was the third one. So we have it over to you. Thank you. I'm hoping you can. Uh, I'd like to hear your perspective as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just to moderate. Ah, I, I, I do have perspectives. I'm sure you. Um, HCR's role in Europe, or that's a bit. Uh, Clear. I mean, the High Commissioner, as many of you know, is, is the previous Prime Minister of uh, Portugal. And he made it clear early on that for Europe, um, we are there to support Europe, but not to, re or let's say, re re uh, support the governments, but not to replace the governments. And that's a very big difference because this is everything that's been happening, as I said, the last five years within Syria and now what's happening in Europe is unprecedented. So UNHCR doesn't have, normally with, uh, with Western countries, UNHCR works with um, the governments to look at resettlement and to look at very, very specific protection-related issues. But what's happening here is different. And so where a government in Greece, you know, we, we have been sending um, site planners, we have been sending some doctors, we've been sending people to help um, to help support the government with registration of refugees, trying to use our skills to be able to help support the government for what they need. But we will by no means um, be you know, intending to replace, which is what we do in many other situations where the governments um, in many parts of the world are weak or do not have enough money. Similarly, we're encouraging the governments, whenever possible, to use the money to be able to help with integration, although it's become now so large that we are working with governments to have, um, to work with particularly with the NGOs and non-governmental organizations so that they can receive money. So we will be having our, a second appeal that will be with UN and NGOs to be able to actually help them work in, in, the, um, in, in, in Europe. The, <coughs> excuse me, the cash is, is very interesting and um, there are two issues that I'd like to address with cash. Number one is that cash and conditional cash and development is, is by no means new. And when we talk about cash in humanitarian settings, there are two aspects. One is not there are two. One is not for the refugees to actually start livelihoods with the cash. That's very important, but that's a separate program. What we're talking about here that's new. And this is hard for people to get around donors because they, they're hoping that cash, number one, will be much more cost effective, which it may be, therefore they'll save money. But number two, they're hoping that um, there'll be some sort of sustainability here. But, but that may not be the case in an emergency situation where we would have been giving goods to refugees. Now we're giving money and they choose the goods. So there's no... Um, the sustainability aspect isn't there except if you go beyond their basic needs to develop. Uh, develop. And I, I, I misspoke when I said I prefer um, unconditional cash. What's unique is that there needs to be, an, and I think we, World Food Program, and others are developing guidance. Cash may, may be inappropriate in many situations. So in fact, we're not, although, it, uh, although I misspoke, we're not supporting cash. What we're supporting is a choice of the most appropriate modality. And likely in many situations, it, it may not be cash, it may be a mixture, it may be conditional cash, or it may be, I mean, conditional cash, for example, in Lebanon and Jordan, early on, we were actually, or our partners were giving cash to rent. So refugees would get it and they would use it for rent. Um, in some places, some NGOs were actually giving it to the uh, locuteur, the, the, the person that is um, 
the host family, they would, be, they would have that money to be able to improve. So we're not yet there in this situation where conditionality, meaning let's give you cash that you can spend, but you have to have your, your daughter or your son go to school. But that is, that is very important. And the local one, too, yeah. Yeah, the local one is, I may have to dodge that question because I don't have enough. It's not because of where I'm coming from and on the more of a technical, I think are some other people in the organization could ask. The, the one thing, though, that I would say is looking, and I'm cheating from The Economist, but they, they even talked today about the idea of integrating the refugees in cities and not putting them all into one area, into you know, a ghetto that will then mm -hmm. self-perpetuate. If they're going to integrate into a country, they're going to need to be able to speak the language, they're going to be able to get job training, they're going to be able to, must be able to mix with the population. Mm -hmm. we, we take three more questions, and uh, we're fortunate um, to have uh, a former uh, commissioner on, on labor among us, Laszlo. I would uh, very much be interested in hearing what you think about a proposal uh, of the right to work in the European context. It, uh, we, we give you time to think about it because we'll have uh, three questions uh, first. So we have two microphones there, and there's a gentleman up front that would be, be next. Uh, and we, we try to get to everybody. Thanks. Yeah, hello. My name is uh, Jihad Sliman. I'm one of the refugees. I'm Syrian refugee. I came here with my family last year. I actually worked for the United Nations in Syria for five and a half years, and I had to quit my job, quit my studying as well, to reach Germany eventually. I was lucky to find uh, the opportunity to c continue my studying uh, master's here in, uh, in Germany. Okay, and uh, you actually answered my question. It's regarding the biggest uh, concern to the refugees here, which is integration. Uh, so I would like uh, to, to learn about the common programs between the UNCR and the uh, German government here in Germany, whether they are, yeah, does exist, and um, what, uh, yeah, you know, services do they offer to the refugees here? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So it might also be a question we can uh, pass on to uh, the representative from the commission uh, here. Uh, yes, you next. Thank you. Uh, good evening, I'm Fritz Finnen, I'm a first year student at uh, Hertie School. I was wondering if um, the refugee camps were to be dissolved eventually, does UNHCR already have um, concrete plans how to support uh, the local housing um, policies? Because especially in order to prevent uh, having competition between local population and refugees over housing opportunities in an already tense atmosphere. Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, no, sorry, there's one, uh, one oh. the gentleman there, I'm sorry, yeah. apologies. No, no, yeah. not at all. Yeah. yeah, good evening. My name is uh, Stefan Ossenkopp. I work for a news service, Executive Intelligence Review. Um, this young Syrian gentleman gives a perfect example of what you mentioned, that the Syria was a secular society with young people who, had high, who were highly skilled. But the country has been bombed back to the Stone Ages. But if you look back at Germany, which was bombed after the Second World War, we were also highly skilled. I wasn't alive then, of course. But um, with the so-called Marshall Plan, uh, we got outside help and rebuilt the country. And that led to the so-called economic miracle. Now, my question is, do you think that the Marshall Plan or a deviation of the Marshall Plan would be a model to rebuild the country? And if that signal, if that signal were to be put out by major governments worldwide now, and UN bodies, wouldn't that stimulate some some sort of a spark of hope in the young uh, in the in the young uh, refugee uh, population? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, firstly, good to where are you? Good to see you there. Um, I would love to hear more about what um, the right to work and other areas would be. Did you come directly from Syria here, or did were you actually living in one of the other countries before? No, actually, I came uh, through the this uh, dangerous trip through the ships. Okay. Um, thank you. Well, we don't have time now, but I'd like to hear more. Um, the the refugee. Sorry, one one aspect is the integration. UNHCR 
will, it's really going to be each of the national governments within Europe that will be working on that. We're not experts at, uh, at integration to begin with, and also it will be all up to the government. So uh, although we may be discussing with the German government and others, it's not, we don't have the expertise to be able to, to look at um, integration and, and actually uh, mentioned to the, the German government how they should be doing this. That's not our, we're really more of a protection agency and a solutions agency, but I assume most of the governments will be looking around and um, at the experience of what's happened with, with uh, migrants and uh, they can learn from that, particularly what's happened in, in France. Um, refugee camps, you know, th there are two things, I, I'll, I'll deviate slightly just to say that um, th there's been now more money particularly for UNHCR and World Food Program, our budgets last year, 2014, were higher than they've ever been uh, in the history of the two agencies. Yet, it's not even close because of the magnitude and the number of emergencies that were occurring. What's happened in the Syrian situation is, besides being a middle-income country and having a, a, an ep a, a demographic and epidemiological disease profile more similar to Germany than to, to other, um, let's say, less developed countries, um, the amount of money that is, that is spent in Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey on a refugee is significantly higher, as you can imagine, than in Chad or in uh, Central African Republic. But what has happened is that the donors, there's a tremendous amount of earmark money going towards the Syrian refugees, previously the Iraqi refugees, which means that our long-term forgotten protracted situations have actually been reduced, um, which, is, which, be, which has been a problem. So it, it's just to say that, um, and I had actually, but I didn't play it, but I, I forgot. Um, but I had actually a, a video of uh, a visit I did a while back just in Cameroon with the Central African Republic just to make that point. Um, that's number one. But number two is, so for the, and why I'm thinking of that is that the camps, the question about the refugee camps, um, we don't do a very good job. So I mean, as I said, we're learning as well and we're changing. So for instance, in the past, number one is we, we don't decide where refugee camps are put. It's the host government that decides, but we try to influence that. We're now, we've developed what's with architects a master and urban planners, a master plan concept. We're looking now, we didn't do this in the past, at the development plans of the country. We're now looking at where markets are, where schools and, edu and, and uh, health clinics may be to try to plan and also flooding in other areas to try to better plan where a camp will be if we have to have a camp. Um, but at this point, we're not, it's very difficult, as I said, once a camp is developed, to actually um, disable the camp until the refugees go back home. So to my knowledge, we're not actually looking at camps to disable at this point. Um, it would be nice if we could, but that, that's not happening at this point. There was the Marshall Plan? Uh, yeah, the Marshall Plan. The High Commissioner is certainly um, discussed, not a Marshall Plan, but discussed with, with uh, with, with the, the, the Western governments about how much money will be needed to try to deal with this. But we're not really at that plan. You know, post-World War II in, in Germany, the, the war had ended. The hostilities here were nowhere near, as you, you know, um, we're nowhere near there yet to even deal, to deal with the hostilities. I think what's, so I think it's very clear about rebuilding Syria, what, that there's going to be, be need a tremendous amount of money. But I think really more what we're looking at right now, as someone said, is we have to deal with, not we, not UNHCR, but leaders, particularly in the Security Council, need to deal with the political situation in Syria. What we're doing right now, as everyone knows, is, is Band-Aids. We're trying to help with the situation. But until, from a political level, something is dealt with, uh, I, there's no, uh, there doesn't appear to be an end in sight. And certainly now, with the recent events, um, you know, it's very unclear what the, what the future is going to hold uh, in Syria at this point. Thank you. I'd like to uh, give the word to Laszlo, and after Laszlo, after Mr. Kuhnle, because some of the questions refer to the European Union as well. Over to you. Well, indeed. Um, but I would like to start by congratulating you for uh, this excellent lecture. And um, I would like to introduce my question, since it's a QA, and a <laughs> with the endorsement that, indeed, uh, from the perspective of the European labor market, 
uh, it should be obvious for people that uh, once a refugee status is given, once um, asylum is provided, uh, the right to work uh, should also accompany uh, this process um, uh, for many reasons. Uh, first of all, because of the recognition that many of um, the people who come as refugees are productive, they can contribute, then they need to contribute. But it's also, uh, in my view, a European self-interest to ensure that this community which newly arrives uh, to Europe should economically succeed. It's not only about providing uh, security uh, to people who don't have security in their home countries, but also to ensure that um, at some point they become uh, capable of supporting their own families, supporting their own communities, and after some time to rebuild their country. Because this is going to be the generation which at some point will be able to uh, rebuild Syria and hopefully uh, the entire uh, Middle East. Uh, but that will be a longer time. Um, indeed, integration is important. I've seen many arguments whether the integration should only apply to the labor market, but also access to benefits, access to equal uh, minimum wage, which is a, obviously an important question in, uh, uh, in, in this country. Um, but um, integration is obviously more difficult when so many people come in a short time. And so many people come through very few gates of the European uh, Union. So these difficulties need to be tackled through burden sharing um, and using the EU financial instruments. I also used to be responsible for the European Social Fund, um, which is primarily about supporting employability in the European Union, but a certain share of this European Social Fund, of course, um, uh, can be allocated for this very purpose, to help refugees integrating in countries where they would like to stay or where they, uh, where they can uh, integrate in the labor market. And um, um, I just wanted to mention that I'm not only a former commissioner here, but I'm also a Hungarian. And, uh, <laughs> and um, if I may ask, uh, if I may close with a question, um, what do you think about the countries which find it so hard to understand uh, the nature of uh, uh, this refugee uh, crisis? And the whole approach which you presented tonight uh, would be just very, very alien. Alien? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. If, would you. Would you like to add? To well, uh, maybe um, sort of two thoughts. One on the issue of uh, integration, uh, building on what uh, uh, Commissioner Ando has uh, just said. Um, uh, we have, as European Union, we have certain means of supporting our governments with the issue of integration. But of course, it's a shared responsibility with many. We have European funding, we have the European Social Fund, uh, which has quite a lot of money, up to 20% of which can be used for migration-related expenditures. So there can be some money uh, to help with the integration of, of refugees. Uh, we have other money from a regional development fund. Uh, we have now an initiative to support young scientists, because you also spoke about uh, also the scientific skills often of, of many of the uh, arriving refugees. We have a special fund introduced now for people who can go into uh, science. So I think there are opportunities and chances also uh, when integrating refugees into our labor market. But of course, this needs to be done early on. I agree with the commissioner. Um, certainly at the point when uh, the refugee, when the asylum procedure is completed and the refugee status is granted, but maybe even before that, uh, at least in cases where there's a very high likelihood of, uh, of the status being, being granted, um, th the sooner the better. Um, but it cannot be only on the shoulders of the EU or the federal level or the communal level. It has to be something which, which is done um, together. And I think there are efforts. And if HCR comes in with its expertise, um, I think uh, then we have a very good sort of background um, help from, from the UN side. On the Marshall Plan, very much as Dr. Spiegel said, um, in Syria we are not there yet. Um, we are building up now a trust fund for Syria, one billion out of EU money um, to help Syria, but it's the humanitarian crisis still. And we need to find then the bridge to gap out of the humanitarian crisis which we are in to eventually uh, come to a rebuilding uh, of, of the country, the society. We are not there yet. Um, the EU will certainly be among the major donors uh, to help uh, with the rebuilding, but now it's in the hand of a political process. You all know the situation we are in. Um, it has to be a UN-led process um, to get us out of this uh, situation. Once we start rebuilding, the EU will be there, but now we are still looking at the short-term um, humanitarian aid and not yet the long-term uh, rebuilding and development. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. Exactly. Just a couple um, areas. Thank you. Both very, very interesting. Um, some of the numbers. So we, when you look at, um, I think it's his name is Hans Rosling. Do people know who I'm referring to? Yeah. So if you go on, he he's does wonders with numbers. I think he's Swedish. Mm -hmm. But um, if you look at YouTube, he's got a wonderful, very simple thing where he looks at how um, the numbers, and I've spent a lot of time in Lebanon in particular. I mean, one in four registered and one in three, probably because there are many that are unregistered, um, Lebanese, uh, people in Lebanon are actually Syrian refugees. It's, it's extraordinary, the numbers. And then he compares it to Europe. Uh, and you see that, at least for the moment, it, it, is, it is the amount of, of, of refugees that have come here is a relatively small percentage. Obviously, if this number continues for a long period of time, that's, that's uh, clearly everyone knows that will be very, very difficult. And it can't be just Europe, and it can't be just some countries within Europe. Um, but that's that one. So the next thing is to look at, and I know um, I know Europe is the EU is discussing with Turkey, but um, you know why there have been a lot of people for many many months before it became into the news. Many people, many Syrians were arriving in Europe. It just wasn't really um, making the news. But for some examples, in um, the amount of money that the donors were giving for the Syrian refugees in Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey in the last six months to a year has significantly reduced. And that hasn't been helpful, as you can imagine. So as, as an example, and in fact, I, I was saying I have to leave at 7 because I have a, a, I'm going back to Geneva tonight where I'm based, and we have a, a very important meeting with the World Food Program. The World Food Program was proportionally giving the most amount of money to Syrian refugees as vouchers to buy food, usually through supermarkets that I showed. They were giving, uh, at the beginning of, let's say, eight months ago, they were giving $30 per person per month. Okay, and then it went down to uh, I think around 24, and now it's currently I believe it's 13 dollars per person per month. So that's the amount that has gone down, and so Syrian refugees obviously can't uh, can't survive. Now they've moved so that they're only giving within Jordan those refugees. There are two camps, Zatri and Azraq, in Jordan where refugees are based. They're now only giving food vouchers to those people in the camps. So. I think one way to look at this is obviously looking at how you're going to be dealing with the, the, the refugees here, um, but also looking at the support that are needed by Jordan, Lebanon. Jordan and Lebanon have been receiving a lot of money. Tur uh, Turkey has actually been paying themselves for most of this and actually has not not been until now. And they've, I, I think I'm off, but it's well over $2 billion that Turkish government itself has actually been paying for, for the refugees. So I think we need to look at those aspects. The last thing is just on Hungary. Um, I was there, I guess it was three weeks or four weeks ago, at the train station when, when a lot of this was occurring. And it was certainly baffling. It was very interesting to, to, to see. Um, if you talk about the ingenuity of, of refugees and how the world has changed, I'm sure you, I always see how ironic this was. I'm sure most of you know that Steve Jobs was a, from a family of Syrians. He was an immigrant to, uh, to the United States. And all these refugees have smartphones. And they are, and I was at the train station, so they were trying to figure out where the trains were going. And they're moving, and we were chasing, so we were, we were chasing them. We were going to set up first aid stations, then Hungary changed, then they moved to Croatia. And so we were following around, but they're, they're so innovative now. And I, I read a report in the New York Times last night that now some are trickling through Russia to, to Norway. So I mean, they are going to be moving around until, until a, pardon, by bicycle. By bicycle, absolutely, because they can't take the car over. So um, until there are solutions there, they're very innovative. I'm sure they're going to help many of uh, the economies in Europe, but they're going to be very determined. We tried to say to a pregnant woman, I remember very quickly, we should take you to hospital to deliver. She absolutely refused because she was worried she would be fingerprinted, and she insisted that they move on. I mean, that we, we wanted to give vaccinations. They said no. They were not staying for more than a couple hours, or ever they were, until they could get to their final destination. Yeah. I know you have to leave at, at 7. Um, Mr. Kuhn also has to go to uh, a meeting. Uh, these are busy times. I think what we uh, take from this is um, 
a lot of food for thought. I think the paradigm shift that uh, you told us took place at UNHCR, at, at UNDP, perhaps still has to arrive in Europe. I think we have to think about how to handle the situation in, in different and hopefully innovative ways. And uh, I think you have helped us on the way. And I think we should thank you for delivering the Cappuccino lectures this year. Cappuccino lectures. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, we, um, we want to thank you for, for asking the question. Apologies if we didn't get to, to your question. There uh, is, however, a reception outside, and maybe that's uh, to say thank you again. Thank you.